Thanks so much and welcome to the Computer History Museum. I'm John Holler, the CEO, and I'm so pleased to welcome you all tonight to the 25th anniversary of Photoshop celebration on behalf of our trustees and our staff and our members and all of our great volunteers. We always like to recognize fellows of the museum who are in the house tonight, and we have two wonderful fellows who are sitting right up front and very much responsible for everything we're gonna be talking about, Chuck Geschke and John Warnock, so I wanna say hello to them. So glad you're here tonight, guys, thank you. So let's get started. Tonight we're putting the band back together. For, for Photoshop fans, this is a little like a Beatles reunion, but instead of John, Paul, George, and Ringo, we have John, Thomas, Russell, and Steve, who are rock stars in their own right for sure. Uh, but first things first, everybody who's here from Adobe tonight will know that Photoshop 1.0 shipped from Adobe exactly 25 years ago today, February 19th, 1990. And for those of you who work from the left side of your brains and like precision, there you go. <laughs> and for those of you who are inclined to be right-brained, this is, at its most fundamental level, a story of human creativity. And the creation story begins, as you heard a minute ago, with two of our guests, the Knoll brothers, Thomas and John, who were working thousands of miles apart and trying to solve very similar problems in image processing and editing. We'll find out what those problems were and how they came to solve them which is the story of how Photoshop came to be. Russell Preston Brown, our third guest, was senior art director at Adobe at the time and saw the magic and potential of what the Nulls had created. It was the right product at the right time and Russell became and still very much remains one of the great evangelists for this product and he may be one of the greatest evangelists for any software product ever, anywhere. And like Ringo, last and certainly not least, is Steve Gutman, who is uh, now back uh, working for a company here in the Valley and was product manager for Photoshop at Adobe in its early days. All four of them played vital roles in making the product a reality and bringing it to market and making it what it is, simply stated, the standard in the world for image editing by a long shot. Please join me in welcoming John Thomas Russell and Steve. Thanks, guys. <laughs> subtle, subtle. Oh, subtle. Yes. <laughs> did, I, did I upstage everyone? I certainly hope not. Certainly hope Russell not. likes I, to make I, I didn't entrance. Even notice. Yes. <laughs> so, Russell, you must, you must tell us the story. The story? Behind your costume. Uh, oh, oh, why? <laughs> well, thank you for asking that. Costume? Why am I wearing about? this costume? I did hear someone ask, is it a costume? Maybe we should determine. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is a garment. <laughs> there will be a quiz question later on which Adobe font I am wearing this evening. Mm. Don't yell it out. Don't yell it out. <laughs> uh, just getting close-up <laughs> pictures. Why I'm wearing this costume? Because I have an Adobe event coming up in April. It's a Photoshop event that's based on a Shakespearean theme where we will be creating handmade books with Shakespearean images, text, and graphics. All of those postscript elements, why we're here today. Gosh, that's April in the Carmel area and it's called the Adam Conference. A-D-I-M conference.com. There, did we get the plug? I got You did, you got the plug in really well. I'm not here plugging anything at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's the ultimate graphic design conference. And um, yeah, it'll be cool. Okay, it's fantastic. fantastic. It all right, there you go. Got it so in. Now we Thank know. you. Thank you. All right, so for those of you who don't know everyone, let me just make sure you know in order. It's Russell, Steve, John, and Tom. So there you guys are. Let me ask you just to start out, did you ever expect 25 years on that Photoshop would be? where it is today. Why don't we start with you? Uh, well, when we were coming out with uh, Photoshop 1.0, uh, the personal computer revolution uh, was less than 15 years old at the time. So there, there were no software programs that had been around very long at the time. And the sort of the longest I, I can think of at the time was probably Microsoft Word from uh, the early uh, 1980s. So that was only probably seven or eight years old at the mm. time we were coming mm. out with uh, uh, Photoshop 1.0. So the concept of a, a software program uh, lasting 25 years and staying as uh, number one in its, its market for that long a time period 
was kind of unimaginable. Mm. And so it's, it's, nothing... it's, a, it's a real testament to the, the continuing Photoshop team that they're able to uh, constantly uh, upgrade Photoshop to deal with major changes in hardware and market needs and keep it uh, dominant in its uh, market. Yeah, yeah. Any other, any, anybody else want to say, yeah, I knew 25 years it would be. Well, I, I think we, we were all just surprised and shocked by how, um, how quickly Photoshop uh, became popular. And as I mentioned to you earlier, it was sort of at the confluence of a lot of stuff that was happening in hardware, you know, color scanners, beginning of digital photography, color printers, uh, and, uh, and, and people needed some engine to, to show these things off. Mm. Yeah, in a lot of ways, Photoshop was uh, a software package ahead of the hardware, you know, so, so we had all these capabilities yep, yep. that were just a little bit beyond what, what a lot of the computers and monitors and video cards and uh, scanners um, were really uh, ready for. But uh, as soon as they became available, we were there. Memory manufacturers as yeah. well, that, mm, <laughs> that, that took a while. <laughs> so we sold a lot of memory. I, yeah. I, I saw that at, at this time when I saw it for the first time. I saw it from the eyes of a graphic designer and it was the ultimate graphic designer tool at the time. And, my tunnel vision said, okay, this is the perfect tool for graphic designers and doing pre-press, you know, and going to press. And yeah. I had no idea, okay, who, why would a photographer need this? Very narrow vision. I think John Warnock knew exactly where this was going, but I thought, good, I can do pre-press with this. Mm -hmm. I think it was until later when the cameras came out, yeah. the scanning got much better, that I said, hey, gee, this is, might work for photographers too. <laughs> But I, I think it was when Photoshop became a verb, is, is when I felt... When was that? When was that? <laughs> that might have been, you know, 92. You think that early? That quickly? So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty fast. All right, so this is not the only uh, Photoshop-enabled eye candy you're going to get tonight. We have another... We have another... We're going to show s several images tonight because it is, after all, about Photoshop. There's this... I mentioned the Beatles earlier, Paul McCartney, uh, just a really wonderful photo that was shown at the uh, Grammy Awards two years ago by Jeff Wong. Have, everybody seen this? Have you seen the, the image of uh, McCartney? This is really fantastic. What, so, and Russell, what would it take, what would it take to create that? This, that mean? this has at least, I'm gonna say 50 layers, a um, hundred <laughs> layer masks, and um, depending upon the year this was created, several of those were smart objects. Um, at the, I think this is before smart objects. Oh, and this person has a masking mastery, um, getting those uh, fine details to show up. How's that? Uh, <laughs> yes. That's good. Yeah. Do you, find yourself, do you guys find yourselves doing that? I mean, do you, do you see something like this and, and then go through in your mind, okay, so this is, do you kind of deconstruct? Well, you know, so I, I was the, uh, the first like really serious Photoshop user. And there was, I had a, a short window when I think I was probably the, the most accomplished Photoshop user in the whole world. Yeah. That uh, <laughs> is now very far from being the case. I regularly work with, uh, with artists that are tremendously accomplished and I have no idea how they're doing it. <laughs> it's, it's astounding what they're, what they're capable of. All right, so mentioning the first user story makes me want to go back now to the origin story of how Photoshop came to be. You have jokingly referred to it as the way that you got out of working harder on your PhD yes. at Michigan. <laughs> and you guys were thousands of miles apart doing very different things. You were at Industrial Light and Magic. Talk about how this all happened between the two of you. Yeah, well, for me, uh, it sort of starts with uh, um, a recognition that, that everything that, that I have ever been paid to do started off as a hobby. And then I got enough better at it that, uh, that I started doing it as a profession, which kills it as a hobby. Mm -hmm. And so uh, how I got started in the film industry was as a model maker. I, I built miniatures as a, as a kid, and, and that was my in in the, the film industry. And as soon as I started doing it professionally, it Kind of killed it as a hobby. And so I took up a new hobby uh, since I'd been around motion control cameras that were photographing these miniatures. I thought they were fascinating, these you know, robotically operated things. And uh, I decided I was going to build my own motion control system. And, uh, and I did that as my uh, uh, final project at USC. And based partly on the strength of that, I got hired at ILM as a motion control camera assistant. And uh, so I killed that hobby. And so um, I was very interested in the field of computer graphics. It was uh, you know, just in the, the very 
kind of early states, there's interesting things starting to happen. And ILM was the first place I worked at that had a computer graphics division. Um, I'd worked at other places that, uh, that were all kind of uh, stage and optical printer kinds of places. And you're working on a film. Yeah, I, so I was a camera operator at, at, at that point, uh, way over on the other side of the building. But I got a, um, a tour of the computer graphics department, and this was uh, a few months after uh, George had sold off uh, the Lucasfilm computer division to Steve Jobs and uh, became Pixar. Um, but we still had a bunch of their old equipment, and we were starting up uh, an ILM computer graphics department that was using that equipment. And one of the things I got a demonstration of was the Pixar image computer. And you know, the, the, as George tells it, the original mandate for the, the Lucasfilm computer division was to build a digital optical printer. So this was uh, started with a uh, uh, laser scanner that could take a piece of film negative and scan it into a digitized image. Um, then there was the Pixar image computer that was the uh, custom image process. It was a special purpose computer for just doing image processing. Uh, and, th and then when you were done manipulating the, the images, you could put it back out onto film on the same laser recorder. And that the demo demonstration that I got will not impress anybody today, but it, um, it seemed magical to me, and I, I left with my head spinning. And the, the, the demo was that they loaded up a, an image into the frame buffer of the Pixar that had been scanned from a piece of film. So here it is, you know, pixels coming onto the display, and they sharpened it. And, uh, oh my God, <laughs> because I think I could see what the implication of all of that was. If you could take image, images from film, you could bring them into the computer, you could manipulate those pixels and then put it back on onto film. There was literally no limit to what you could do yeah. in the, in the yeah. middle. Yeah. And, um, and so I kind of left kind of thinking, this is going to change everything. This is, this is going to transform the business. Uh, boy, the possibilities are just just unlimited. And so that was going on in my head. Um, I started writing um, ex my explorations in computer graphics. I, I wrote a little ray tracing program. And, uh, a f and displaying the, the images on the, on the Macintosh 2, I had a brand new Macintosh 2 that I just bought, you know, color computer with a math coprocessor and, you know, uh, four megabytes of RAM and- Four uh, megabytes. <laughs> um, and, Displaying the, the image in color on the, was, was really complicated. The API for you know, opening up a window and setting up the palette and handling the update events and all the stuff that it took to display an image on, on screen was not particularly interesting to me. I was interested in the code that figured out how bright a pixel should be. And I remember I was talking to Tom about, God, why is the API such a, a pain in the ass? And he said, well, I've already written a lot of that, that stuff as part of my, my thesis work. Why don't you use my tools to, uh, to display them. You can just have your programs uh, write out raw images to, to disk. And uh, I think around that, uh, during that visit, Tom showed me, he was in graduate school, and he showed me what he was working on for his thesis. And it was, uh, it was you were working on a, a vision algorithm for recognizing objects, uh, predefined objects in a digital picture. And you had a whole suite of image processing tools that ran on a Macintosh Plus and to say, it was uncanny the resemblance between how Tom's tools worked and, and kind of what they did and the Pixar. Mm. But the Pixar was a $120,000 piece of really exotic special purpose machinery that no, no hobbyist was ever gonna own. And yet Tom had written stuff that was you know, very similar, you know, running on a little black and white machine. But uh, it was, that was a computer I could own. And so I started uh, playing with this stuff, and uh, and you know they, these were uh, these were tools that were hosted in the MPW shell. It was the Macintosh Programmers Workshop. And uh, for those who aren't familiar, it's a it's a command line Unix-like um, scripting environment. And so you can write tools that run in the shell, and that's how they were all constructed. And so if you want to uh, take these little atomic operators and do something. Com with them, you would write a script that just chained all these, these commands, and that was exactly the way the Pixar worked. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and so I was satisfied for a little while with this, but uh, um, it's a bit of an arcane business, um, setting up all the scripts, and, uh, uh, and I remember asking, hey, how hard would it be to take the core of these, these tools and put them together into a little application? 
And uh, I think one weekend, <laughs> I'm sure you remember better than I. Tom, what were you, what were you doing okay, uh, that led you to write all this cool code that he was, was blowing him away? Okay, uh, 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 we're similar in a lot of ways, but we're different in one, uh, in one significant way. And uh, John figured out what he wanted to do with his life at a very young age. <laughs> and I suspect it was the summer that the first Star Wars movie came out. And he saw it. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, Five or six times, or how many times did you see that summer? Something like that. (laughs) And he sort of decided that he wanted to do special effects for movies at that time. And sort of started his whole career path through model making and then uh, uh, going to film school and learning motion control and stuff like that in order to achieve that goal. And he actually ended up uh, getting a job at ILM Mm -hmm. and now essentially is uh, co-president of ILM. So, uh, is that all? <laughs> <laughs> so he, you, he's, he's actually what? achieved his goal, but, but he decided this goal very young. Uh, I'm what? very different in that uh, I was sort of procrastinating in school because I didn't want to figure out what I really wanted to do in my life. So uh, I was in graduate school working on a PhD, and I had done all the research part of that PhD, and it come down to the final part where I actually have to write this very long paper and that was the thing I really hate about uh, the school, is writing papers. So, but it was, so it was a lot more fun to be working on these little tools and, 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 and adding features that John requested. So uh, I, was, I spent several months just sort of just like working on this, this, this program and, and sending him new copies and then... By the way, this is the first copy <laughs> of Photoshop <laughs> right here. I'm so this glad is, you uh, showed that. Back in the era before... Um, before uh, high-speed internet connections. Uh, Sometimes it was easier for Tom just to uh, take a build, put it onto a floppy disk, and literally mail it to me. (laughs) So this was the uh, the first one, which I still have after all these years. That's perfect. (laughs) That's that's absolutely amazing. (laughs) Russell. I took a picture of it. I'll be duplicating them. (laughs) (laughs) You you know, one thing that, that might be worth mentioning is uh, these guys shopped Photoshop around to a, to a whole bunch yeah. of companies. Yeah. And, and remember, this was you know, back in the Stone Age, and, and a lot of those companies passed. They didn't mm-hmm. see it at all. Yeah. And the story that I heard from Fred, Fred Mitchell, who, who brought me into uh, to Adobe, was uh, you guys gave a, a demo to, to John, and uh, you looked at that, and he goes, I want that. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Well, Russell, you were one of, you were one of the very first exact people to words. see it, right? Uh, that's the way I heard it. <laughs> I'd like to hear your story of the first. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, we, we had been tinkering with, uh, with this just sort of for hobby purposes. And I remember uh, many a uh, uh, phone call where I would, uh, was playing with it. I would ask, hey, what if it could do this? And what if it could do this? And I think uh, one of the first requests, um, I think, came um, when I realized, uh, after I, I used uh, the, the program, which is called Display at that point, to, uh, to read one of the, the renders that I'd just done. It was, it was in the early 80s uh, or mid-80s when uh, everybody was doing chrome spheres over uh, checkerboard planes. <laughs> so I, I, was, I was doing those too. And, and uh, I put it over uh, in the computer graphics department, looked at it on the, on the Pixar frame buffer, and the gamma was wrong on it. Um, because I was just learning about how this all, all worked. And, uh, and uh, I asked Tom about, uh, could there be a gamma correction tool? And I think uh, that's where the levels tool yes. came uh, from originally. I, 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 I added the levels dialog as the, sort of the first adjustment in Photoshop. And uh, in addition to implementing the gamma feature that John had requested, I also I solved a problem that I had in, in the darkroom many years ago from uh, trying to print black and white prints and trying to adjust uh, the uh, exposure of the enlarger and the contrast of the paper and the chemistry in order to get the, the blacks to be black and the whites to be white. And the, it's a very frustrating process in a dark room because you're, you, you're, you're adjusting two different things uh, uh, which both affect the white and both affect the black, but in opposite directions. So you have to do things in uh, you know, opposite directions and, and, and do a lot of trial and error to get things right. Mm. And the levels dialog is a sort of graphical representation of that process. And it has one slider that controls the blacks and one slider that controls the whites. So it became much, much easier to adjust images. 
And then sh showing the histogram shows you uh, where the data is in the histograms, and it becomes a very simple process to do very quick uh, mm -hmm. brightness contrast, uh, gamma adjustments on images. I'm fascinated with that story that you guys told in the little film about working on things together and not even speaking in complete sentences. <laughs> you were so on the same wavelength. How did that work? Well, well we grew up together and, um, um, <laughs> you know, we're related, so uh, yeah, <laughs> we were able to communicate. Uh, you know, I, I'd hear the beginning of a sentence, I kind of knew where he was going with it, and I think vice versa. Um, and so... When did you know you got it right? When did you know you'd built enough stuff well, together and it yeah, was ready to be a product. So th this, uh, this fun little hobby project uh, kept getting more you know, fun little bells and whistles until it got to be kind of a cool little um, application. And I called up Tom and, and said, I, I, I think this has commercial possibilities. I think we should try and sell this. Yeah. And I, I do remember that call that Tom said, oh, you are nuts. Do you have any idea how much work writing a commercial application is? And I, I had no idea how much work writing a commercial application is. It was a good thing. So I was uh, completely full of naive optimism. And, and uh, I remember saying, hey, if, uh, if, you, if you'll write this thing, I'll figure out how to make money with it. And that's and, uh, what Steve said, right? You started talking to companies about yeah, And so, it was called Display at the time. It was called Display, and then uh, after I got enough features in it, Tom called it Image Pro, which I actually, th I still think, is a great name because <laughs> it implied all the all the right things. It was image processing sort of for professionals. What about uh, Photo Hut? Not a good verb. Yeah, <laughs> not a good. Yeah. Photo Hut was your favorite name. <laughs> um, Photo but, uh, Hut, right? Um, Photo Hut was the other one. Yeah. It was. Um, <laughs> it was uh, Image Pro for a few months until I was at a SIGGRAPH conference. And I saw that there was a, a company that was selling a whole suite of image processing tools that ran on Apollo workstations, and it was called Image Pro. <laughs> and uh, so I called Tom and said, uh, it's taken. We can't, um, we can't, can't, do, it. can't do that. And, and uh, I think I suggested Photolab, and it was Photolab for a little while. And I was I, so then I, I was shopping it around, and, uh, and one of the companies I, uh, I did demo for was Electronic Arts. And at the end of the, that hour and a half demo I did for the guys at Electronic Arts, they said, so what are you calling this thing? Again? Oh, we're calling it Photolab. Uh, and the guy reached over and he pulled a box off the <laughs> shelf, and it was an Electronic Arts project, product called Photolab. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, OK. And I called Tom and told him, all right, Photolab's taken. Uh, because you know, it was before the internet, you could do searches for that kind of thing. And so, uh, that, you, you yeah, yeah. twisted it to Photoshop. No, I, I was giving a demo to an, another company that was actually trying to sell me some image processing technology to add to Photoshop, but uh, it sort of turned out that, uh, you know, Photoshop was actually the more interesting demo to them. Uh, <laughs> And at, at the end of the demo, I sort of explained our dilemma on the naming and, and how we had called it Image Pro for a while, and that was taken, and we had called it Photo Lab for a while, and that was taken. And he sort of came up and said, hmm, how about Photoshop? And I said, oh, I don't know, that sounds good. Might if I use that? And he says, oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the, and our, our expectation was that whatever uh, publisher we ended up with was going to come up with a real name for the program. So this was really just a, a, a temporary thing. And indeed, as I recall, uh, there were a lot of, uh, of names that were thrown out as possibilities. Um, oh my God. And, and they were all kind of failing. <laughs> I think I want to hand this to Steve. Yeah. Steve. Yeah. Steve. Uh, this, yeah. this, this was kind of my Waterloo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I had come into Adobe, had done an internship there the summer before uh, in the middle of my MBA. Came in uh, to work on Photoshop. I had a background in, in, in photography. And uh, one of the first suggestions was, oh, we can probably do better than Photoshop, can't we? <laughs> and so I went through this torturous process of, uh, of, of, of trying out these uh, different names, you know, brainstorming, going to the lawyers, doing the trademark search, uh, you know, and kept hitting brick walls. I, I remember going into to John, and uh, John said, what you really want to do is you want to take two words and kind of put them together to make something new, uh, you know, which no one has, has, has used before. And he goes, uh, I remember this so, so clearly. How about Imaginator? 
was like, God, no. Um, I said, no, I said, I'll go check that out. And, and mercifully, it was actually taken by, by Cross. And, and at that point, uh, I forget if it was you or me, uh, why don't we just stick with Photoshop? Oh, that was mine. That was mine. I, I'll take it. Now, Russell, you were, you were one of the keys to getting it into Adobe. You were looking that's, at that's other... on the Wikipedia page. Thing. Let's just so continue I, that rumor yeah, here today. Okay. I was... I, it, I'm sure John was hesitant to purchase it and acquire it, and I had to go tell him it was the right thing to do. Ah. Let's just make that clear today. No, I don't think that was it. I've got this hunch. John knew exactly the moment he saw this. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, and, I was, and I believe that I saw it with Fred said, we better let Russ see this. <laughs> And um, I started drooling. I had seen high-end machines. I had sat behind a Cytex operator and paid them $1,000 to move the mouse. Move it to the left. <laughs> well, that's an extra $500 if you go up there. <laughs> so uh, he sits down with the Macintosh, and it empowered the user. No longer needed that Cytex workstation. I had my workstation with all those capabilities and powers. Th that was an amazing meeting. and. Um, I still remember to this day, and I believe it, <laughs> I don't remember a lot of things. Um, <laughs> he brought up an image, that was cool. Uh, I believe it was a, a lake. I don't, where was this lake that you brought up? Uh, I think one of the, the demo this? images I actually used was a computer generated image from Pixar that Aha! wrote to point right. It was a synthetic lake. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he took this thing called a magic wand, and you clicked on the surface of the lake, and there's this selection forming, and that, that seemed pretty cool because I'd seen high-end systems, but it's when you showed me that it was a soft edge selection because you could lift it up and move it around from the background. I think that's when I totally freaked out. That's probably when I ran to John's office. At least that's what it says on the Wikipedia page. Russell Brown <laughs> ran to John Warnock's office <laughs> and said, buy this. <laughs> it well, sounds I'd, good. I'd, I had been uh, shopping it around. I, probably met with uh, 25 or 30 different companies. Uh, and I got a whole variety of different reactions. Uh, um, some people seemed to get it and others didn't. But uh, uh, the, the demo I did it uh, uh, for, for Mr. Warnock here, uh, uh, that was a great experience. It was a, a very thorough demo. I kind of went through pretty much every function that was in the, the program. and uh, and. John was asking very perceptive questions that uh, gave me a lot of confidence that he, he didn't have to have anything really explained to him. I think he really understood what he was looking at. And in the conversation after, I remember he said something that, that, uh, that really uh, made us feel very warm and fuzzy uh, to Adobe, which is uh, an observation that, that uh, the desktop publishing revolution is going to really take off when we solve getting images in there, that uh, right now there's a PostScript, there's the Adobe Type Library, there's Illustrator, there's PageMaker. The one thing that's missing that's going to prevent this from just exploding is going to be when we get images in there, it's going to change everything. And this, this could be the product mm, to do it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, do you remember oh, heck yeah. how, many, uh, how many copies a year you estimated that this would sell when you first, Steve? Steve? Oh, geez. Uh, <laughs> That's, a, that's 25 years ago. <laughs> uh, I, well, I, I remember um, trying to benchmark it off of Adobe Illustrator, which was, I, I think, selling in the small thousands of, uh, of, of units a, a month. And uh, it, uh, it, it completely blew it, it away. It like 10 times that, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it had uh, just an incredible sales growth, and it just... Every new version we did, you know, it seemed to kind of hit a, hit a new level, and it was, uh, it was just uh, phenomenal. Well, well, John and I were in a meeting with actually uh, John Warnock, and the number he gave us was 500 a month. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I had uh, about six months before um, we, we shipped, I had uh, dinner with, uh, with Jerry Burrell, I think was uh, the, the head of running Macworld magazine. Oh. At, at the time, and, and uh, uh, he said, his estimate, said, I think you're going to sell 20,000 in the first year. And I, that seemed like an astoundingly high number, and I think we, we beat it. <laughs> as, who, as who, were the first, who were the first really big 
customers for Photoshop? Well, so uh, Dave Pratt, who was the, the, the GM of, of, of that division, basically characterized uh, everyone who bought it in the, in the first year as being friends of Russell Brown. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember that. Uh, I remember that. <laughs> he gets around. You got a lot of friends, Russell. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, went, I started giving presentations. Um, Guy Kawasaki put on an event in um, Santa Barbara called the Max Summit. I recall some of my first presentations at that location, and I'm, I'm pulling up images. I started doing word slides because Liz Bond, my director at times, word slides, Russ, word slides. That's where you need to have to word slides. And I found that I was boring my audience until I started showing them more and more Photoshop, photo, photo images. Ah altered images, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and I got their attention and I got the audience to, um, to respond and to, to laugh, which was key to a presentation. <laughs> and um, <laughs> uh, the interest really started moving and I do hands-on courses and these presentations. And I'd say that was really the beginning, showing it to those groups, early adopters, the graphic designers, the artists, early photographers who we're scanning, oh, heaven forbid we took um, film and scanned it on Cytex machines or other desktop scanners, even the, the Barney scan. Talk about Barney scan a little bit. I need to refresh my memory on all of that. So the Barney scan came out and you had it bundled with it. That was the first version I was working with, the Barney scan. Mm, so mm, we had yeah. to scan the slides in and bring them in in that fashion. So it was a bit difficult and I noise reduction, spot removal, oh my goodness, all sorts of things were key at the time. But um, I, saw, I remember being a, a bit slow, um, sort of charting it, and then it was the, the new uh, cameras coming out. I, I remember this very specifically. I asked Canon this question. They, had, they started with analog cameras with little discs that spin inside, and they recorded like on magnetic discs. I said to Canon, I said, so is some, this analog technology, is this the future? It's, oh, yes, yes. What about this digital stuff? <laughs> no, no, analog's the future <laughs> at Canon. <laughs> but I think it was when we went digital and Kodak introduced that, and bang. Yeah. yeah well, you, you used to put together all these uh, artist invitational events. Yeah. And, I um, remember we had David, David, David Hockney, Hockney yeah, with uh, his little amazed. dog. I want to talk about that. Yeah. We, we actually have an image of David Hockney sitting um, in one of your invitationals. So you want to bring that up, John? So fortunate. Um, <laughs> that's, um, that's, that's, that's I had Doug Menuey photograph. Thank goodness for Doug Menuey. Um, so fortunate that um, David had an interest in um, printing to a color Xerox machine. He had a Xerox machine, and this was the time in which he was making art from a color Xerox machine. And so along comes this postscript Xerox machine and the Photoshop combination, and he says, I think I need to come to Adobe and learn this Photoshop. And he came to this event, and we put on invitationals for graphic designers and artists to introduce this to them and to uh, have them experiment and play with this and thus creating more evangelists to go out into the world and sell um, Photoshop and even Illustrator at the time. Right. And, and it's, worth, it's worth pointing out. Yeah, point out something. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> it's worth pointing Is out. Is it uh, something about me? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll get there All eventually. Good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we launched Photoshop. We introduced it to the world kind of officially um, in September of 1989 at the AIGA, whatever it was in uh, uh, Expo in um, yes. San, San Antonio, wow. right? A couple of memory so, cells just locked yeah. in there. <laughs> so, um, so we actually you know, got involved with that conference a little late, and they didn't have room for us in the trade show part of the arena. So we shipped, uh, it was at least a dozen Macintoshes with these big CRT displays to the hotel, and we set up sort of a, a training yes. area in a, in a suite in the hotel and brought people, you know, we kind of dragged them off of the trade show floor and, and took them up and, and taught them uh, Photoshop. And what's, what's hard to believe now is it was looked upon as such yeah. an anomaly or yeah. such a peculiar, you know, making art on a computer, painting on a computer, what, why would someone do that? Yeah. Uh, and, and so it was really just at the very cusp of, you know, graphic arts moving to, to the computer. Were you bringing from these, from these invitationals, your evangelism out there, Russell, were you bringing back requests to these guys saying, 
if we could do these following five features, we'd really, I'm interested to know how you feature up a product like <laughs> How did the feature, yeah. I, would, I knew Thomas's phone number in Ann Arbor, <laughs> and I would call him directly. And I recall, I did, I did one day convince him of one good feature, but he took it out later. I took it out later on, but um, yeah, I think it was, Today, I think it has to go through several meetings <laughs> to have any features added. Mm. Um, but in those days, it was a phone call. I think, do you like it, Steve? Do you like it, Thomas? Uh, let's all three of us like it. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I well, mean, it, it was, it, you know, a lot of the features were added at John's request. And uh, John would often suggest a, a user interface for that feature or how it would, uh, it would do. And He's a very technical guy and uh, would often make suggestions that sort of I, I didn't think fit into the uh, uh, gist of the Photoshop user interface. So I would initially sell him, no, that wouldn't fit into the user interface, that would be kind of kludgy, but I would often ruminate about that for a, 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 a week or so and then sort of come up with a way to, oh, I, if I do it this way, it will, it will work with every other feature in Photoshop and it will sort of be very uh, orthogonal to the other features and it will work very well. So. I would come back a week later and say, oh, by the way, the thing you were asking about, you can do now, but, but you do it this way instead. I, I have a question. There's a question in the audience coming in. I, I, can, I can hear the person asking this question. <laughs> why didn't John's name appear in the startup screen? It did. It did, did. yeah. yeah. Uh, the, 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 four, the four people up here are the four names on the Photoshop oh, 1.0 okay. splash screen. I, 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 I it's not there anymore. Okay, okay. <laughs> I, I don't know how. I'm losing my memory. I thought it wasn't there in the beginning. So it was there. Okay. First, first uh, I think, two, two or three versions, uh, three okay. or 2.5. Okay, cool. Okay. And, and, and while, while John uh, deserves a, a huge amount of credit, huge. He, he also deserves a certain amount of blame. <laughs> because John, John wrote these filters, these displacement filters, uh, twirl and wave and, and, and so on, that went out with the first version of Photoshop. And for the first, you know, six to 12 months, we would see all these horrible images that use the, the, the twirl filter. Mm. Oh, yes. That, that was, <laughs> we did. Yeah. Let's not name any of those fine photographers who saw doing it. Well, and then they well, published well, a book. Well, one of those yes. uh, uh, filters was the pinch filter, which is still actually used quite a bit today. Yeah, uh, it's useful. <laughs> it's, it's fun and it's useful. What about lens flare? <laughs> yeah. John, were you the power user? Because you were making films well, using I, I, this. Well, I do think that that contributed to the success of the, the product in that uh, I was really using it and I was pushing hard on it. And, uh, and I, I had very grand visions of the cool things that I wanted to be able to do with it. And uh, so I was always uh, pushing for higher end and, and additional features. And I would be working on it and find, boy, this is kind of, you know, I need a better way of doing this. And I would then discuss the problem with, with Tom and he'd come up with some genius solution to that problem. And I think that having the feature set be shaped by somebody who was trying to really do production art was uh, a good part of the success. These guys are also humble. They didn't want big introductions. You've got, you've got biographies in your programs, but it is worth noting that the power user for Photoshop won the Academy Award in 2007 for best visual effects for Pirates of the Caribbean. So just, I don't I wanna. <laughs> So when we talk to a guy who's pushing features out there and really <laughs> pressing on a piece of software, that's the kind of, uh, that's the kind of creativity you, you bring and the thought process you bring to all of this. So I thought that was, that was really interesting. So you've got the, now you've, you know, by the way, Tom, I read something that you actually, when you were thinking, when you were thinking of this, you were thinking like a cinematographer when you were starting to write the code. And I just found that to be so interesting, not to go all the way back to the origin, but what was it about the cinematography part of this that really appealed to you? I think you're probably confusing me with him. Well, I, I don't know. I, I, I took it down from an oral history, so I thought I, I was pretty sure I had you thinking like your brother, but maybe well, not. Well, uh, he, he would make uh, suggestions in, in terms of features. So a lot of the features of Photoshop 1.0 were uh, uh, things to facilitate uh, doing, uh, for example, compositing of movie frames. So one of the first demos he did was a uh, blue screen extraction and right. compositing uh, using uh, some of the uh, channel operations in, in Photoshop 1.0. Okay. Yeah, yeah the calculate menu was uh, mostly about being able to, to do uh, um, 
for film like uh, composite operations. Mm. All right, so let's let's kind of talk about where we are today with this. I, I don't know; version numbers are not really used anymore. But if you had to, if you had to say, we started with 1.0, and now in 2015 we're at what? Well, well, what it, well what the, uh, there actually is a version number if you dig deep enough, down enough in Photoshop, and I think it's at 15 at the moment. Okay, um, uh, but there were a couple dot uh, five releases which were. Uh, essentially full releases as far as the team was concerned. Uh -huh. So uh, we probably had like 17 iterations of Photoshop over the years. And uh, there, the, the Photoshop team started out as uh, me on version one uh, with John doing uh, several plugins. And it has grown over the years. And uh, any product that lasts 25 years in the market has to adapt dramatically to many changes in technology and, and computers. And uh, Photoshop, you know, the, the size of the code base has, has increased tremendously by you know, a factor of 100 or something like that. And uh, it, it has a lot of people working on it now. And a lot of them are here right now. And How many people are working I, on it I would now, like to have all the right? Photoshop engineers stand up in the room. That'd be, yeah, that'd be nice. Be <laughs> there they are. So uh, I, I thank you all for, 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 for continuing to keep my baby going. And, uh. <laughs> That's great. Well, and if you, had to, if you had to say there are a certain number of features in it now or features that have been added over the years, what's the... You were going to ask me, what was the a significant moment, other than seeing John do his presentation, what was the next significant moment? What was the next significant well. moment? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> you said Mark Hamburg's here? Uh, is Mark, Mark here? It was yes. The so, so Mark is the fifth beetle, right? Okay. Where's the fifth so, beetle? That's a good. Uh, uh, yeah. I, Mark, just go with the flow on this story because it's a good story. That's great. All you. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, <laughs> what was that? Oh, so I, Mark says to me, he, it's um, they're working on Photoshop three, three point oh. Says you need to see something, Russ. Here in my office, this is, this is the next thing. Mark showed me layers, <laughs> layers, <laughs> and he made an That's extra great. point. If I now go with the flow, Mark. He showed me that they had a soft edge between them, and a, that a brain explosion. That was the second brain explosion after the first one seeing multiple layers with soft edges. I no longer had to do that tricky thing where you floated a layer. Come on, we all know. You, to, you float the layer and you can erase the layer and you can deselect the layer, but the moment you touch any place else, the layer drops down. <laughs> and it's yeah, I, I do think uh, layers is probably the most powerful, significant <gasps> feature that, that ever got added to the, the yes. program. I mean, it's got all kinds of great stuff that's been added over decades now, but uh, yeah. I think uh, layers was the most transformatively powerful thing that got put into the program. Wow, yes. We're gonna see an image that's pretty heavily layered uh, in just a second. I wanna put another one up here now though, uh, so we can talk about a specific thing. This is by uh, an artist that you guys all know well, photographer Steven Johnson. Mm -hmm. And I wanna use this uh, to ask you, Russell, about a, a phrase that you've I know used that a lot called not touched a single pixel. Yeah, you call it, you can't move the tree. That's nope. the rule. Nope. You no, can't he, move the tree. He only dodges, dodges and burns his photographs and adjusts the colors. I know that for a fact. Yeah. Is he here? I think he is. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. Hey. Be careful. <laughs> I, I recall he caught me moving a cloud once. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so go ahead. That's the question. It's really... Now uh, that I know it's just, here. Just um, <laughs> that... Uh, it it reflects the kind of amazing the, the amazing work you can do on a photo and absolutely remain true to the photograph. Um, as I recall, uh, you were working with the largest. You pushed Photoshop to its limits to get the largest files possible to print huge, large prints and putting on exhibits. And um, you were one of the uh, in the forefront of pushing this technology and showing the technology off. Um, to the world, a significant role that he played 
to bring it to the level that other photographers could appreciate mm -hmm. and um, enjoy. And, and he helped with a lot of the duotone, tritone, oh, quad tone I, stuff as well. I was going to mention that. <laughs> I was going to mention that. Yes. <laughs> My memory just hit me. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> the Denali poster. Yes. Correct? Mm -hmm. Yes? Say yes. 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 And, 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 and the, the, yeah, yeah. the, the yeah, yeah. Uh, presets that shipped in Photoshop uh, too. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. I want to talk a little bit about the Photoshop ecosystem that's built up because there are so many tens of thousands, way more than that, users around the world. They're in every possible uh, profession, vocation. There are user groups, tons of conferences. What's What's that like? How do you stay in touch with that? How do you how do you use it? How do you get into the the, the Photoshop ecosystem and help that inform what the product continues to become? You're yeah, looking at me. <laughs> I got the Russell question. Oh, that's oh, a Russell question. That's a Russell question. <laughs> okay, you go to conferences. You sit in a audience. I think the largest audience that I spoke to on Photoshop was four thousand people. Oh. Uh, that was in South Korea, um, and it's being translated simultaneously. Yikes! Um, in that such, that's just the largest audience. But in a in the early Mac world audiences, we had um, the users would come up and give us suggestions and ideas. As John said, real world um, input on things we really needed to be in the product. Yeah, and brought those back to right. the group and made suggestions. I also think that through our invitationals we did, the programmers would come in and watch the David Hockneys of the world using the program and go, well, why is David you know, doing it that way? It's because it seemed more natural to him as an artist. I think some of that feedback comes in as well. Mm. So I, in the early days, we're hearing a, a, a closer contact because there's fewer people using it. But uh, right now, we have a huge structure of um, input coming in from all directions on the web and through all these forums and um, the tech support, all of that information comes in and feeds down into the team. And they're staying on top of things. And the one thing, what's, you know, what's kept me going over these 30 years at Adobe, heaven help me, um, of course, I started Adobe when I was 10. They were <laughs> 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 Over these um, 30 years, um, yeah, it's, it's all this information comes in. You get to, we're sharing it, bringing it to the programmers, and magic happens. I was going to say, um, why after 30 years am I still in this? It's a playground to me because each time I think that everything's been done. I have every possible tool I need in Photoshop, and then the programmers, I see something new at Adobe, and I'm like, how did I live without that? It's the how did I live without that moment, and they keep on coming up. The programmers continue to keep me motivated and excited, mm -hmm. and that's what I just have to applaud them, that that's, if you can keep me motivated and excited for 30 years of really cool features, that's what we need to bring out to our users. And that's why we're here in the industry. Mm -hmm. That's why we have great, mm -hmm. great following mm -hmm. is because we come out with really cool things that you didn't know you could live without mm -hmm. one of those moments. Well, that's and, and, and one of the reasons there is such a robust ecosystem and such a huge community is because it's such a deep product, there uh, tons and tons of ways of getting really unique effects and part of this ecosystem is about sharing how you do things, how you get certain effects, how you, you know, do certain kinds of masks. Yeah. Mm. It's well, exactly I right. We've, you've given them the tools. There's no preset way. I've always said that's the hundred and fourth way that you can do that same <laughs> operation mm -hmm. because there are a, a thousand different ways to to get to the same results, and it can, and many and times, new results that you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And John, you think everybody? I walk through these and look at the artwork on in the internet today, and I see things that just astound me. And how the heck is that being done? Um, I don't. I'm, I'm. I'm way behind the uh, the curve of what's being done out there, the amazing things that are being done. But yeah. I think another reason why uh, Photoshop is, has been so successful is that 
It has the long history of the people intimately involved with creating it are also its users. And that started with the two of us, yeah. and especially uh, John uh, spent a lot of time actually using Photoshop. So uh, there's a very direct feedback between the user base and the programmers in terms of designing features, and, and uh, that results in, uh, I think, a much higher quality product. And that continues to, the, to this day uh, especially in the sort of areas of Photoshop that I'm working on, which is the uh, Camera Raw plugin to Photoshop, and uh, by indirection, uh, the Adobe Lightroom develop module. Because I am an uh, amateur photographer, and also all the, in fact, all the four engineers on the Camera Raw project right now are all avid uh, amateur photographers. So we actually use our own products uh, uh, to, to a great extent. So uh, we're, uh, we're eating our own dog food, as the phrase goes. And uh, so, so if, if the product's not working the way we want, often some of the best feature ideas come from the engineers themselves working on that product. And, and they're in a position to make it better directly. You want to explain where Camera Raw came from in the first place? Yeah. <laughs> Which I think is an amusing story. <laughs> OK. Uh, in uh, 2002, uh, there was a. Uh, 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 raw formats were, start, were starting to become popular in cameras, and uh, there, there was a sort of planned feature for Photoshop to add raw format support. And uh, no, nobody really knew how to do it uh, at Adobe, and so we were look, looking at you know acquiring something, and uh, that sort of fell through. And uh, one of the advantages of, of uh, sort of being the founder of Photoshop is I sort of get to work on the areas, any area that I find interesting, I, I can generally uh, get that job by, by volunteering <laughs> for it. And so uh, I, I had just purchased a uh, Canon D60 uh, DSLR, and it shot at RAW format. So I had a personal incentive to have RAW support in, in Photoshop, so I volunteered for this project. <laughs> so I uh, went off on a... Uh, I just got in the camera right before a vacation to Italy, and I ended up doing a lot of the initial coding for the first version of Camera Raw while I was on vacation in Italy. <laughs> so. so when you say the users are closely associated with the program, you're not kidding. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm often many of the users are the programmers themselves. Right, yeah, got it. <laughs> this, this, there was the first moment, seeing photo, Photoshop for the first time, layers. The third moment was when I asked you, what are you doing with this raw stuff? And you gave me a copy of it. I went out and got the same camera and went off and took some photographs in the Tetons, as I recall. And that was, it was life-changing to be able to go in and adjust yeah, yeah. a raw image. And did that scare the manufacturers at the first? They weren't terribly happy with it. They weren't terribly unhappy with it. Yeah. It was sort of... It's a very strange relationship. seemed to scare yeah, Nikon uh, <laughs> desperately. I, I do remember that they, they weren't uh, documenting any of the formats. They were keeping them proprietary. Mm. So they all kind of had to be reverse engineered, weren't they? Uh, at first, everything was reverse engineered. Yeah. Uh, so. so there is that other thing that is occasionally done with Photoshop, the which is... Uh, you didn't bring those. <laughs> I brought one because I really, I think it's so funny... Uh, this is a California lawyer named Svetlana Sangre, who has inserted herself into <laughs> pictures with lots of celebrities. You can see presidents, uh, movie stars, secretaries of state. Um, and she actually, she had this on her website, uh, just simply advertising that this was the kind of law that she practiced. And she got her license revoked in California. <laughs> 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 for, for doing this. Uh, but, you know, I, I want to use this because of something that you said, John, which is that um, it, this is a tool. You said this in the oral history as part of the film we saw earlier. It, the tool doesn't have ethics built into it. That's not what it is. Well, it's no, a tool. I mean, no, no tool has ethics built into exactly. it. Exactly. A, a hammer doesn't have ethics built into it. It's, <laughs> and you can use a hammer to, to do something wonderful. You can use a hammer to do something really bad. And uh, Photoshop is, uh, is like any other tool in that respect. That, uh, that, uh, and I, I'd like to, to focus on all the, the really amazing and beautiful things that people do. Sure with it, but uh, certainly there's a, there's a dark side. There are people that, that use it for uh, 
uh, I think, a damaging and unethical things. And I think it's, it's, you know, it's contingent on the artist to apply the ethics. Well, to be fair, this, is, this was happening long before Photoshop. We have, oh, another, yeah. we have another image here, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph Stalin uh, had someone removed from that photograph. This was before digital technology, but I think he did call it Good unfriending. Work. So Good work. Was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was ahead of his time. Uh, there's one more image I want to talk about, because this is going to layering, which you were talking about, Russell. This is a, a, a photorealist named Burt Monroy. You, you guys may have seen oh, this yeah. Times Square. Bert's here, oh, is Bert's here today? Is he here? Bert? Nope. No. Nope. Bird is amazing. All right. Yep. So this is a uh, this this made its debut in 2010. It was displayed on a 25 foot light box. It's uh, 60 inches by 300 inches, six and a half gigabytes. It took four years to create. It's composed of 15,000 individual Photoshop and Illustrator files, and taking a cumulative total of all the files, the overall image contains 700,000 layers. That's dedication, man. And, and <laughs> is that possible? I think the, these are hand painted. Yeah. Right. Don't zoom these, in. These aren't. Don't these zoom aren't, in. There's, there's no photographs photos. involved there's here. No, there are no photos. Right. Yeah. It, don't zoom in because I didn't get enough hair. <laughs> are you in it? Somewhere. Uh, Bob, yeah, really? We're yeah, all in it. I think everybody here is in it. Yeah. Are you guys all in it? I had, I had no idea. That's that's really amazing. Uh, John and. Uh, Obviously. You guys are up front. Yeah, we're up Those front. are the two of you right there. Uh, but I'm sure, pretty sure Russell and Steve are. Oh, there you are. Yep. Russell, you're behind the light pole. Oh, there. With <laughs> Julianne. Yeah, you see him? yeah. Well, have, what, a, what an a, Easter egg. I don't have the costume on. You guys were all in the. Uh, <laughs> all right, so then, I, is this, are these among the most exciting applications for Photoshop today? This kind of ultra dense, highly layered use of the, of the product? <laughs> State that question again. The most yeah. exciting <laughs> uses of Photoshop. What the you know the things that really you talked earlier about. You think you've seen it all, and then suddenly you see something that blows you away. What's the most exciting thing that you are seeing like that now? What am I seeing? To, I'm I'm the guy at the theaters who's going up, and if I had a magnifying glass, I'd look at the grain structure on posters at the movie theater. I love what's being done with movie theater posters and finishers, as they're called in LA. I think they're super, super talented. They run into the level of Bert with the detail and quality, the illusion and their use of layers. They're true masters in that they have to take nothing and make it into something. They've, the actor's not gonna come back and pose for them. And they've got a variety of different images they have to pull together. They have to mask them and make the illusion that all of the characters from Star Wars or from Harry Potter are all in the same scene at the, all at the same time. I really admire a, a photo retoucher from LA who can make a really quality poster for movie theaters. Hmm. That, that, that's my, that's where I, I, I admire that type of quality. Hmm. Hmm. I, I mean, I think I would have to say I, I continue to be sort of blown away by what people accomplish with this. And, and it's what people, I mean, we always sort of said, you know, whatever you can imagine, you can, you, you can create with Photoshop. And what is phenomenal is seeing what, what people imagine. New stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I regularly work with a bunch of uh, film concept designers that... Uh, are guys with the, with just a tremendous sense of, of design and composition and, and color. And you know, 25 years ago, these guys would be doing these as gouache illustrations or acrylic uh, uh, paint. Uh, but I see them regularly working super fast in Photoshop, uh, that, uh, that painting these things, uh, they're able to work so much more quickly than they ever were with um, you know, physical media. That, that uh, Something that, that normally would have taken them a couple of days to paint, uh, they're doing in a few hours. And that's, I find that just amazing, mm -hmm. spectacular, the productivity that these guys have. Mm -hmm. You remember the, the first poster we did for, for Photoshop, what the tagline was? The six, 
Six faces? I remember, I don't know what I had you, for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, You Can Dream in Color. Oh, that's right, right. With Adobe right, Photoshop, right? That. Still holds. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's take a few questions from the audience. Oh, no, uh, you promised no questions. <laughs> for the future. And see, people have illustrated. You can't see, but people We've have agreed that John and Noel will be answering all questions. The question, card, the question cards have been Photoshopped by some people, so you'll, you'll <laughs> like that. Uh, voice commands for Photoshop, a kind of voice interface for Photoshop to make it do what you want it to do by simply speaking hmm. to it. Did we toy with that for a while? Hmm. We could record our voice into a layer for a while. Boy, that was a big seller. <laughs> <laughs> um, personally, yeah, nah, I, it wasn't. The, I didn't see myself in that future. You know, move the pixels to the right or left. I, I, I wanted direct control with a Wacom, or by the way, it is pronounced Wacom, with a Wacom or a mouse. Was I never saw myself falling to that? John, did you ever want to? talk to your computer and tell it to <laughs> move the pixel to the right or the left. No, uh, I can just imagine what a studio would be like with everybody kind of... Uh, <laughs> and and the, the guy next to you uh, kind of uh, wrecking your art because I uh, spoke a little too loudly. Yeah, I, yeah, I think you, you, want, you have seen it in some movies where they talk to the computer in, in, yeah. in some futuristic yeah. movies and they like have this very, very low resolution image and they zoom in on... <laughs> Two pixel, and they say, enhance that. <laughs> Very clear. I guess we're working that. on that, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, but, but realistically, uh, what uh, we're probably looking more toward is uh, migrating the uh, Photoshop user interface onto uh, the new generation of uh, mobile devices yeah. where we have touch interfaces. And uh, that requires a lot of redesign of the user interface because... Uh, while, while it's much more direct and you're actually working directly on the image, it's, it, and that, that way it's sort of easier, uh, your fingers are also kind of big compared to what a, a mouse pointer was. So we have to uh, go through a re redesign process as we uh, uh, create uh, mobile versions of the uh, Photoshop functionality. I'm also uh, impressed that uh, uh, Adobe keeps a close tab on uh, um, research and development uh, in the field of image processing. And I've, I've seen SIGGRAPH papers on, uh, on fairly advanced image processing techniques that then two years later uh, have been implemented in Photoshop. Things like uh, uh, the scene carv or seam carving, um, you know, uh, content to wear, fill, um, uh, taking motion blur out of, uh, out of picture. These are really pretty advanced image processing techniques and I, I love that, mm. uh, that they're, uh, they find a, a home in, uh, in Photoshop. There was another question here, which is something you alluded to a second ago, which is, have you, have you put any things into the, the program at any one time that you were sure were going to be winners and they flopped? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm I, afraid they I, flop. I refuse to answer that question on the grounds that I'd incriminate you in this audience. Uh, did you see anything you didn't like? You know, I think there's there's probably features that we put in that we thought were really cool and that that didn't get a lot of use. But yeah, yeah, uh, uh, some things we, we we put a lot of effort into supporting. Uh, for example, uh, you know, Apple operating system has gone through a couple of initiatives trying to do like open doc was I think one of the uh, technologies that we, we, we struggled to support and uh, basically nobody ever adopted it and it, we sort of pulled it out a couple of versions later. So, mm -hmm. but, but that was more to support uh, an operating system feature that uh, Apple was trying to do that they actually gave up on it. Hmm. I can't think of one at the moment. I'm gone blank. Okay, fair enough. Um, you know, it's funny, we had, a, we had an, a session like this yesterday with <clears throat> David Axelrod, who was the campaign manager for President Obama in, in 8 and 12, not the manager, but key to it, and he's just written this new book. And about half the questions I got related to who's going to win the 2016 presidential election. <laughs> and if you get enough questions like that, you can't avoid asking the question because it's just so strongly what people in the audience really want to hear someone who's knowledgeable talk about. So I want to use that as a setup for the question about this, this question about, about body image and the way that Photoshop is, is seen as a tool to 
change the way that uh, women and young women especially appear in photographs and images and film and, and these other things. And just get your reaction to, you know, some of the questions are referred to as, did you ever anticipate that? How do you feel about it? Do you think that's right? I think we all know the answer to the question about, do you think it's right? But what would you say uh, to so many people who want to know your opinions about that particular use of the product? Steve? <laughs> I'm on the record on CBS Morning News this morning on the subject. It, 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 actually, it, it actually reminds me of, of some of the early days of Photoshop when we were dealing with uh, newspaper photographers and, yeah. and newspaper people, yeah. remember? And, and this, this was an issue that, not the women, but the issue of modifying photographs and how easy Photoshop made it to modify... Uh, how easy it was to modify photo photographs with Photoshop, and isn't that bad? Isn't that unethical? It, it's almost a, a replay of that, you know, sort of in a in, in a different context. Right. And all all you can say is, you know, it's it's up to the artist. It's up to the person to decide, you know, how they want to use the tool. Well, as a father of, of three daughters, uh, I, I do think that uh, that the that um, those very unrealistic body images are damaging, and um, I would like to see a lot less of that kind of thing. Hmm. All right, so here's a simple one. There are a surprising number of questions from people who want to know what your PhD thesis was actually <laughs> supposed to be about. Is that your part? <laughs> Uh, it, uh, the, the topic was uh, computer vision, which is the process of teaching uh, computers to understand images. And this differs from image processing, which is taking an image and doing uh, computer manipulation on it and producing another image. But the first step of many computer vision algorithms is image processing to like find em edges in images so that you can then find the objects in the images. So the, the that uh, I, I took the image processing tools part of uh, uh, my research and, and, and built Photoshop out of that. But the, the exact topic was, was solve, trying to solve the problem or, or part of the problem of uh, recognizing uh, objects in images that are, that are partially obscured by other objects. So I was doing uh, experiments, and I, uh, my, a lot of my test objects were, were a bunch of keys from my pocket, and I would uh, drop them in some random uh, pile on, on, on a piece of paper and take a photograph, and, and then uh, try to figure out which key is where, even though you can't see all of the keys. So uh, it matters, you know, finding uh, uh, portions of uh, the edge and, and, and try to match those with other portions of the edge of the image and, and, and try, try to... Uh, figure out where all the objects are. Mm. Uh, in any case, uh, I, I published a couple of papers on this, and it was, it was in the process of writing my PhD, which I never finished. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. uh, it, 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 realistically, uh, uh, you know, uh, I sort of thinking about it a couple a couple of years after Photoshop, and I decided, is there any point of me uh, finishing <laughs> this? And uh, I, I couldn't think of any, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I, have to, I have to take some blame for this, because I, I, I do remember uh, we got to a, a point where I, I felt like uh, uh, <laughs> this conversation I, I remember having uh, about, this is an opportunity that is never going to happen again. We have to, to really pursue this aggressively now. I, I think you should put your... Mm -hmm. thesis on hold while we while we get the, the this first version out um, yeah and once we we ship version 1.0 go back finish your, uh, your thesis <laughs> but uh, but we have to act on this right now and and, and uh, God bless him Tom uh, actually uh, I mean there's a huge leap of faith dro essentially dropped out of school with no Income um, it was easy for me to do because uh, for me to, to say I, I was a nighttime camera operator at ILM, so I had had my night job as it were, and uh, uh, and I could pursue this because I was just doing it part time. But Tom was writing every line of code, and that was a full time commitment. And uh, um, yeah, so I'm why he's not doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you want to? Now's your chance. <laughs> I forgive him. All right, good. <laughs> 
I always like to save the last question for myself. And I, I use the Beatles analogy in the beginning. You know, they started a band and became a cultural phenomenon. I do just we, wonder. Do we get a closing statement after your. <laughs> if, if you want one, <laughs> sure. I, 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 uh, the, 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 the summation is, is all yours, Russell. But let me, before you do that, let yes. me just ask you how does it feel to have started out to write and be involved with uh, a piece of software and really have created a cultural phenomenon? Well, for my part, I'm, I'm always, uh, always just a little uh, uh, startled when there's a popular culture reference. So I'm watching TV, and somebody will make a reference to Photoshop, and, it, and it's, it's a little weird and surreal and kind of cool. Um, my, there's a ritual my wife likes to do all the time. Uh, after, uh, after dinner, she wants to just watch Jeopardy. And every once in a while, Mm -hmm. Photoshop has been the answer to a Jeopardy question. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you know you've made it, right? That's it. That's great. You know, I have the same sort of uh, uh, special moments when Photoshop's used as a verb. Uh, and the other moment I like to mention is if, if, we, if you walk into a random chain bookstore anywhere in the country or the world even, there's probably a bookshelf of Photoshop instructional books. And so that's pretty amazing to think that I have this bookshelf dedicated to something I created <laughs> in every bookstore in the world, so. You, you know, for me, I, I feel, um, you know, just very lucky to uh, have been involved with a, a product that is this popular and, and, and so on. But even more than that, you know, especially in the early days, the team was just really, really tight. And it was great being a part of that, um, you know, the synergy and the dialogue and the exchange of ideas, you know, first us four and then with Mark and Kevin being added to the team, Peter, and so on. Uh, it, it was just a team that was really in sync kind of moving together and, and doing great stuff. That's great. I have to say something. You get, <laughs> you get, the, you get the last word, Russell. I don't, I, I've never seen myself as being something special or somehow, <laughs> it's just, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, no, no, it's true. I, I, I always saw myself as being in the right place at the right time, but then I've been told, I think Jeff, she Jeff Shewe writes, you know, Russell Brown is responsible for the success of Photoshop combined with the Noel brothers. And I'm going, so yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> um, but it's, it was a fantastic moment to be at the right place at the right time. I had the energy for it. I had the enthusiasm. I think I spread that enthusiasm. But with my closing statement, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna choke up on this one. It was, it was my wife, Jan Davis, who, that's why I'm sitting here. That's why many of you are sitting here, it's my wife. She's half of, of me. She, she put me here, she made, she drove me. She's half of everything that I am. And I'm so happy to be here because of her. Oh, that's so great, Russell, thank you. Get that kid. Well, I Russell didn't get emotional. I didn't get emotional. <laughs> I think we all feel like we've been in the right place at the right time tonight with all of you. So please join me in thanking Tom and John and Steve and Russell for a great night.